Good morning and welcome to Riverview Church Online and a particularly warm welcome if you are visiting us online for the first time. Feel free to get in touch through our email addresses or phone numbers that you'll find on our Facebook page. Now today this is message number four of our Church Redefined series and we're not trying to reinvent church, come up with a new version of church, but rather to redefine what it is. And you can catch up with the previous three messages in our video section on Facebook or on our YouTube YouTube channel. Today, I just want to ask, were you, when you were at school, were you one of those kids that had a mum that would studiously like sew labels into all of your items of clothing so that they wouldn't get lost or confused with somebody else's stuff? I mean, I think my mum even sewed a label into my pants. I'm not sure how she thought I was going to lose those. Perhaps you were one of those kids that would kind of carefully label or mark all of your own stuff, like your pens and pencils and bags and books and things like that, kind of to protect them from loss or theft from those other chavvy kids in your class. You're creating distinguishing features that prove your ownership over those items. I mean, I did this, but when I was at college, yes, in my mid-teens, my childhood best mate, David Foster, and I will name him because he deserves this, he lived with us for a while. And at weekends, I worked in a nursing home, kind of cooking mushy broccoli and soggy soft carrots for old beers. And I absolutely hated the job. But I loved the money because the pay packet was absolutely amazing. And with my first paycheck, I went out and I bought myself a brand new personal stereo. If you're a millennial, you're probably going to have to go and Google what that is. Now, to identify this personal stereo as mine, I scratched my name into the back of it. I'm sure some of you did similar things. And a few weeks later, I couldn't find it anywhere. And lo and behold, David, on the other hand, was just sporting his brand new personal stereo. Apparently, he was so impressed with mine that he went and bought the same model. Like, when I had the opportunity a couple of weeks later, I grabbed his personal stereo and flipped it over to try to see my mark. And you know what? It wasn't there. But what was there was David's mark in the same place. But instead of opting to mark it with his name, the sensible thing, he did what those other kids do, which is they just scratch all over the place so that whatever was there first is completely eroded. Dave, I want that stereo back, please. It's probably worth a lot of money now. Look, we ourselves have distinguishing features. We have traits that are like handed down to us through DNA, you know, physical features that we may or may not like, like big ears, big nose or great hair. You know, something of our character as well that might come from our parents, humour, kind heartedness or our personal uh, personability. Now, all of these things together set us apart from every other human being. They, they make us unique. They make us recognisable. And we can also have distinguishing features as a nation, as a people. Like, we Brits are known to love to apologise. We love to talk about the weather and we love to queue. I'm not actually so sure that's true, but I think people believe it is. And sometimes we even select for ourselves something to distinguish us as part of a family, like a, a wedding ring or something like that, or to distinguish us as a particular tribe or clan or type of people, like the different tartan you guys have, or modern example, football kits. You know, we often use distinguishing features to mark us as something as ours, like belonging to us, or to mark ourselves as belonging to something or someone. And you know what? So does God. He does exactly the same thing. He creates identifying characteristics in his people as individuals and as a people that set them apart, that reveal their true identity, that mark them out as his people and him as their God. And you can know that somebody is genuinely his by their behaviour, by their mannerisms, their choices, characteristics, distinguishing features. Jesus himself says, by their fruit, you will know them. Now, be careful because this now is imperfect. It's a work in progress in all of us, a process that he is doing in us and a journey that we are all at different points along. So we've got to be kind with each other. 
Listen, over the last few weeks, we've looked at some of these kind of identifying characteristics in metaphors that are used to describe the church, like living stones, a spiritual house, a new temple. Each thing is describing something of the identity of the church. And today we're going to see two more very deliberate and purposeful metaphors that Jesus uses to describe and identify his people. So go with me to Matthew 5, 13 to 16, and I think this will come up in the comments section as well. Matthew 5, 13 to 16. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand uh, and it gives light to everybody in the house. In the same way... Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So here we have two metaphors, salt and light, and both of these are worthy of a bit of exploration. And so we're not going to try and do that all today. We're going to split this into two messages, into two parts. This week we'll look at salt. Next week we'll look at light. At some point, you must have heard someone else describe another person as salt of the earth. It's a common phrase, and we generally mean that we rate them, we respect them, that we think that person is quality, like down-to-earth, hard-working types of people, a good and honest person. Those are distinguishing features of somebody who is salt of the earth. Now, what people often don't know is that this was originally Jesus who coined the phrase, talking to a gathering who were listening to him preach on the side of a mountain in northern Israel. So when he says, you are the salt of the earth, he is addressing a specific people at a specific time in history, and he means something specifically by it. He's deliberate to choose salt and light. So firstly, who is the you? He's talking, as I said, to a gathering mostly of Hebrew people, some of whom were newly recruited disciples. Uh, so first and foremost, he is talking to Jewish people, the nation of Israel, God's holy people, a special people with distinguishing features, chosen to be carriers of his presence and to be a blessing to all nations, made with the intention to represent and reflect the kingdom of heaven on earth. And as God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It was those descendants of Abraham who he was talking to right there and right then on that hillside in northern Israel, but this was also a specific appointed time in history that acted kind of like a hinge, a pivotal point between old and new. Israel had been in a repetitive cycle of sin, which led them into captivity, uh, leading to a desperate cry for mercy, which then led them to turn to God in repentance. And then that led to rescue and restoration, but then only to go back to the start of their shameful behaviour and their sinful practices once they felt safe. So the cycle just begins again, each time getting worse than the previous generations. And for centuries, they've been ignoring warnings that God has been sending in his mercy through prophets, saying, please, please turn and be saved, please. And so these people called and chosen to be distinct, to demonstrate God's character and kingdom, but behaving like all the other nations and peoples around them, indistinguishable from other cultures. They could not live up to it. And it is they whom Jesus was hinting had lost their saltiness. What do you do 
if the salt pot, the salt in your salt pot that has been left on the side for too long has lost its saltiness. Well, you chuck out the salt and you replace it with fresh salt. So at this hinge point in history, Jesus comes to fulfill the terms of the old covenant, covenant sorry, and to reveal the new covenant, new wine, new wineskins, fresh salt and fresh salt shaker. And now, because of that, through Christ, we also can apply these words to us today, to disciples of Jesus Christ, to the church, which, as we've seen in recent weeks, is a chosen people who were once not a people, but now are the people of God, a holy nation, living stones being built into a spiritual house, a new temple. And so though we might not be blood descendants, we are made spiritual descendants of Abraham. And now, therefore, we, us, you and me, are the carriers of the same promise. We bear some of the same distinguishing features. We are being made to represent and reflect the kingdom of heaven. We are to be the carriers of presence and the bearers of blessing to all nations. Now, some believers may worry over the question, can I lose my saltiness? And, and if so, what does that mean? I, I am going to look at that later on as we come to wrap up. But first, I think we need to understand what it means to be salt, to be the salt of the earth. I mean, sodium chloride, right, is the most common of table cruets. Every table and restaurant will have salt and pepper on it. Why salt? What, what does Jesus mean by this? Well, salt was plentiful and it was practical and it was a valuable resource in the Near East at that time. It, it was sometimes even used instead of money as wages in the Roman army. Their monthly allowance was called a salarium, which not salarium, but salarium, sal being the Latin word for salt, from which we derive our word salary and also where we get our phrase worth their salt i mean we literally mean they are worth their wages they are worth paying for it was valuable despite being plentiful now if you think about that that's kind of unusual it's often it's rarity that actually drives up value but they were plentiful these people were plentiful god told abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shores so how does each individual remain valuable well listen to this something is only valuable because of what someone is willing to pay for it 1 John 2 verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You are valuable, not because of what you have done or how good you are or even could be, but because of how much he paid for you at great cost to secure our freedom, to inscribe his name upon our hearts and work his distinguishing features into our lives. So now, as today's disciples, a holy nation, a chosen people, the salt of the earth, you have value and God-given purpose in this world. What does that purpose look like? Well, let's look back at this salt metaphor that Jesus used because salt actually had a whole range of functions and purposes. And please, please bear in mind that Jesus is referring to the distinguishing features of his kingdom people in this illustration. So the first purpose or use of salt I think most obviously is culinary use, seasoning to enhance. Salt draws out flavour. I mean, we know this, right? It has the ability to take something bland and make it tasty. Job says, is tasteless food eaten without salt? 
And then he goes on to say, I refuse to touch it. Such food makes me ill. Now that means that Job must have eaten my mother's cooking at some point. So also has the ability to make sweet things taste even sweeter. I mean, can you even buy caramel these days that isn't salted caramel? Would you even want to now that you've experienced this salted caramel revolution? Salt can enhance flavour and make sweet things sweeter. And how sweet the name of Jesus sounds to the believer's ear. The, the other thing that salt is good for is preserving. It's used extensively in preservation for food. Particularly, it, it's used because it destroys the environment in which bacteria can grow and multiply and spread. It, it can slow or even stop the rot. And it's also used to dry cure animal hide so that that hide can then be used for fabric like clothing, like a covering. And listen to this in Genesis, God covered Adam and Eve's nakedness with animal skin. And that's pointing to what Jesus himself, this moment in history, would do to cover the sin and the shame of all mankind. Through you, all nations will be blessed. It's also used medicinally and in healing. Salt is useful in a ton of medical applications. Among them, apparently, it can aid the balance of electrolytes in our bodies. It helps carry nutrients into our cells and it helps regulate blood pressure. Historically, it's also been used to prevent infection following things like amputation. And it was even used in childbirth. I mean, babies were, it sounds weird, but they were rubbed with salt. I'm glad that that's not a practice these days. Imagine all those baby prunes that way. And again, on the flip side of healing, though, salt can also be used as a destructive agent. We know that drinking salty water will make you thirsty and sick and ultimately, if you keep doing it, will kill you. We know that getting salt in our eyes is really painful and sore. And salt was actually used as a weapon of ancient warfare being sown into the ground to make the land toxic and infertile, to prevent the ability for crops to be grown in that land. And there's a great example of that in Judges 9, 45, which I'm not going to read now, but it's there. Check it out. So healing and destruction, the two opposites. Listen to this in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, 16, to the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. To one we smell like death and to the other the sweet fragrance of life. And finally, salt was used in covenant making and in worship. In covenant, I'll read you this example in Numbers 18. It says, whatever is set aside from the holy offerings that Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and daughters as your perpetual share. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and your offspring. A promise made in salt. 2 Chronicles 13.5 don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? Another salt promise. And one of David's descendants is Jesus. And as church, we are all descendants of Jesus. So that promise is true today. And then in worship, Leviticus 2.13, season all your grain offerings with salt and don't leave salt of the covenant of your God. Out of your grain offerings, add salt to all of your offerings. Ezekiel 43.24, you are to offer them before the Lord and the priests are to sprinkle salt on them and sacrifice them as a burnt offering to the Lord. Salt is used in worship, seasoned with salt. Interesting that Jesus would use salt as a metaphor as he inaugurates heaven's kingdom on earth and seals a new covenant. And as worship is moved from temple and mountain into the temples of our hearts in spirit and in truth. So what does this mean for you and for me, for the church? We are church. Uh, and one of our distinguishing features that identify us with Christ uh, as his is our salt-likeness. 
the way we replicate salt. We are carriers of his presence. We have the distinguishing features of the King of Kings, his name engraved upon our hearts. We have the natural properties of the kingdom. We have the power and the authority to affect and to impact the landscape around us. So every uh, season, every conversation and interaction so that the sweetness of the gospel of hope is carried to our community through us as carriers of his presence. Colossians 4, 6 says this, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know that we speak the truth, the gospel, that is seasoning our conversation with salt. Salvation comes by hearing so that they may taste and see that the Lord is good. We are truth carriers. We are truth speakers. We should not be swayed by every conspiracy theory and every opinion on social media because we are called to preserve truth. It matters that we fact check and and don't just go with the flow when we see a post on Facebook. We are ambassadors for the truth. It matters that Jesus has come to cover our sin and shame, to clothe us in righteousness that is not made out of an animal hide, but is made by the blood of the lamb. So how can we present truth? If we're obsessed with the lies and the misinformation that is out there in our lives and in our communities, we are to stop the rot of the enemy's lies by speaking the truth. We are preservers of truth. And in doing this, we rub healing salt into the wounds of our society, the culture around us. And it will sting, but it will bring deep healing. You know, being confronted with our sin and our shame is uncomfortable, painful even. And people will get angry when when it's even suggested that they may not be enough, that they are sinful. But it is through this realisation and the pain of that realisation and through repentance that we can accept what Jesus is offering us. Freedom, spiritual health and life. You know, guys, we're also called to the battle lines, not against flesh and blood, but to be a destructive agent against spiritual principalities and powers. We are to push heaven's front lines up against the gates of hell because they will not prevail. We are to bring strongholds down to reclaim the ground that the enemy has taken, like sowing salt into the soil that make it impossible for the enemy to thrive in this location. And finally, for all of this to happen, our worship, our worship, Our worship is to be seasoned with his Holy Spirit, genuine and true and powerful, even dangerous, but certainly not routine. You know, worship should be extraordinary, not ordinary or familiar. It's not so much a song on the lips as a cry from the heart. It's not so much about where or when as about everywhere and every when. Like not stopping, never ceasing, day and night, never stop saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. How does this happen? How does this work? Church, be church everywhere and every when it's not about this person or that person it's about every living stone being the church in this community it's not about that's his role and that's his role we are all church where we stand where we stand is holy ground because we take the presence of God with us now as I wrap this up you know some believers perhaps even you may worry over that question. Can I lose my saltiness? Uh, And if so, what does that mean? Well, look, we all have times where we feel off the boil. 
seasons where we don't seem to grow, days where it seems impossible to do the right thing, you know, moments where we struggle and we wrestle with our own desires and sinfulness and selfishness. I want to tell you that Jesus is not saying here that if you're not Christian enough, you'll be thrown out and trampled down. Our rescue is not based on what we do or achieve, but upon who he is and upon what we believe. The reason Jesus came is because Israel lost saltiness and there was no one able to recover that. No one was able to live up to it or fulfill the distinguishing features expected of being the people of God. Not one except Jesus who recovered it and lived it, lived up to that standard on their behalf, on our behalf, on your behalf, so that he by the Holy Spirit becomes the seasoning through the salt shaker that is the church. It's his life. It's his presence through us. And he enables us to be a distinctive, a different, a set apart people. It's his presence in us. It's his work in us. You know, Church is not meant to reflect or copy the culture around it. We are meant to affect and flavour the culture around us. We don't get changed by it. We change it by being influencers in our society, by reflecting the one who shines as the light of the world, even through our brokenness and our weaknesses. And that is where we're going to pick this up next week. So tune in then. But for now, bless you guys in the name of Jesus. Amen.